This is a talk about my favorite feature in Go. Many years ago, Rob Pike remarked that uh, numbers are just numbers. You'll never see O-X-U-L-L in a Go source file. And, and, and behind this pithy observation lies the fascinating world of constants in Go. And it's something that is perhaps taken for granted because, as Rob noted, um, numbers, constants in Go, they just work. So today I'm going to show you a few things that perhaps you didn't know about the const keyword in Go. To kick it off, like, why, what's so great about constants? Um, immutability. Constants are one of the very few ways we have to tell the compiler that this number will not change, or this, this value will not change. Clarity. Constants give us a way to extract those magic numbers out of our code and give them names and give them semantic meaning. And, and obviously performance. Um, the ability to say to the compiler, this does not change, um, is a key optimization. It unlocks constant folding, constant propagation, branch, uh, branch elimination, dead code elimination, a whole slew of optimizations. But so what? These are all generic use cases for constants. Like any language, certainly any compiled language can do these things. Um, but we're here at .go. We serve at the pleasure of Lego Fair. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the ways that we can use these properties of Go's constants. And let's do this with a little challenge. So your challenge is to declare a constant whose value is the number of bits in the machine word. Now, you can't use unsafe size of because that's not a constant expression. You can't assign that to a constant. Um, you could make a big kind of bird's nest of build tags and record like the various word sizes for every different platform that we support. But in the future, you're going to have to keep that up to date. And that's, that's big and messy. So instead, we could do something like this. There are many versions of this in the Go code base. Um, they all work roughly the same. If we're on, say, a 64-bit platform, then taking the exclusive OR of the number 0 gives us 64 ones. We shift that 32 bits to the right, and then we end that with a number with just 1 in the far digit. 1 and 1 is 1. And then finally, we shift the number 32 one place to the left. And that gives us 64. So you can do this arithmetic at home for the 32-bit platforms, if you like. So this is an example of uh, a constant expression. All of those operations happened at compile time. And the result of evaluating that, uh, that expression is also a constant. If you have a look in the runtime package, specifically the garbage collector, you're going to see expressions like this used to set up very complex invariants that don't require build tags and unsafe of and things like that to tune themselves to the specific machine. So this is a cool party trick. Um, but again, most compilers can do things like this. Um, perhaps not as elegantly as Go can, but um, most of them can do this kind of constant folding. So let's, let's step it up a notch. In Go, constants are values, and every value has a type. In Go, user-defined types can declare their own methods. We all know this. Thus, a constant value can have a method set. Um, if you're a little bit surprised by this statement, let me show you an example that we use every single day. So here, we have the untyped literal 500 multiplied by the time.millisecond constant, which is a time.duration. Now, the rules for assignment in Go say that unless the type is declared on the left-hand side of the assignment, it's assumed from the right. So we have the untyped literal 500. It's converted to a time.duration, because that is the, the type of timed at millisecond. And they're multiplied together, and you get the value 500 million. So on the left-hand side, we have a constant. Its name is timeout. Its type is time.duration, and its value is 500 million. So why then? Does it print 500 ms? 
And the reason for this is time.duration has a string method. Thus, any time.duration value, even a constant, knows how to pretty print itself. Now, we know that constant values are typed, and because types can declare methods, we can derive that constant values can fulfill interfaces. I mean, we saw an example of that just before. The funct package doesn't assert that the values it was given have a string method. It asserts that they fulfill the stringer interface. So let's talk a little bit how we can use this property to make our Go code better. And to do that, I'm going to take a little digression into the singleton pattern. I'm generally not a fan of the singleton pattern in Go or any language. Um, singletons really complicate your testing. They create unnecessary coupling between your packages. And I think, I feel the singleton pattern is often used not to create one instance of something, but instead to create a place where things like find each other and register each other. A really good example of that is HTTP's default serve mux. Um, this is not a singleton. There is nothing singular about it. Nothing prevents you from creating another serve mux. In fact, we even give you a helper to make as many as you like. So this is not a singleton. Nevertheless, there is a case for some things which really, truly are singular because they can only represent a single thing. An example of that, I, I think one of the best examples of that, are file descriptors. The numbers 0, 1, and 2, when interpreted as file descriptors, represent standard in, out, and error. Now, it doesn't matter what name you give the variable holding 0, 1, 1, 0, 1 and 2, and it doesn't, because 1 always means standard out. And there can only ever be one file descriptor one. So on the screen, these two operations are identical. So let's look at how the OS package declares them. This is, the, this is from the standard library. Now, there are a few problems with this declaration. Um, the first is that the types of those variables are files. They're not the respective reader and writer and closer that, uh, that you might expect. Now, people have long complained that this makes replacing those declarations problematic. But the notion of replacing them is precisely the point of this digression. Because can you safely change any of those once this program is running without causing a data race? I argue to you that in the general case, you cannot replace them. In general, if something is unsafe to do, as programmers, we shouldn't really let, us, let them think that it is safe um, because they might begin to depend on that behavior. So can we change the definition of standard out and friends so that they retain their observable behavior of reading and writing, but they become immutable? And it turns out we can do this very easily with constants. For example, we have a, a read FD type. It's just an integer. We give it a read method. We do the same thing for a write FD. We give it a write method. And now we can declare constants of those types as constant expressions. And they behave just like the standard OS versions do. In fact, you can make this change in the standard library. And it causes uh, one compilation failure when you're trying to build the standard library. Um, and I'll leave it as an exercise to you to figure out which package breaks. Another case of things which look like constants but aren't really are um, sentinel error values. IOEOF, SQL error no rows, um, X509 error unsupported algorithm, and so on are all examples of sentinel values. And I say this because they all fall into the category of expected errors. And because these errors are expected, we're all expected to check for them. How do we check them? To compare the error you have with the one that you're expecting, you need to import the package that declares that error. 
And because by definition, Sentinel errors are exported public variables, any, any code that imports, for example, the IO package could redefine what IO EOF is. I'll, I'll just say this again for clarity. If I know the name of IO EOF, I can import the package that declares it, which in fact I must do if I want to compare it to my error, and thus I could change its value. Now, by convention and probably a bit of dumb luck, this doesn't happen very often. But, but technically there's nothing to prevent you. Um, for scientific purposes only, I tried to make this change, and I can tell you that things stopped working very quickly. <laughs> Indeed, a Ruby programmer. <laughs> but replacing a less frequently used Sentinel error value um, might cause some more interesting side effects. Are you absolutely sure that none of your dependencies contain this line? If anyone in there is depending on the 120 megabytes of source code from Kubernetes, are you absolutely sure that this doesn't happen? And if you're hoping that the race detector would spot this kind of subterfuge, um, I suggest that you talk to the folks who are writing testing frameworks who do replace OS standard out very carefully so they don't trigger the race detector. I'll leave you to do your code or audits later. So putting aside the effect of malicious actors in your code base, the key design challenge with Sentinel errors is that they behave like singletons, not constants. I want to digress for a moment to talk about the most important property of a constant. Constants aren't just immutable. It's not enough that we just can't change their declaration. Constants are fungible. And this is a tremendously important property that I think just gets no attention. Fungible means identical. I mean, for, money is a really good example of this. Like, if I asked to borrow 10 euros from somebody and then I paid them back a week later, the fact that they gave me a 10 euro note and I gave them 10 coins back, from the point of view of a negotiable instrument, is irrelevant. The money's the same. It works the same. So things which are fungible are by definition equal. And equality is a really powerful property that we can leverage in our programs. Even if we follow the exact procedure used by the IO package, this is the line that it's declared on, to create our own EOF value, my EOF error and IO EOF are not equal, even though we use the exact same procedure to make them. So when you combine the lack of immutability, the lack of fungibility, the lack of equality, you have this really weird set of behaviors that stem from the fact that sentinel error values are not constant expressions. But what if we could do that? What if we could make them constant expressions? Ideally, a sentinel error value should behave like a constant. It should be immutable. It should be fungible. Let's recap how the built-in error interface works. Any type with an error string method fulfills the error interface. This includes user-defined types. This includes uh, types derived from primitives like strings. And this, of course, includes constant strings. So with that background, consider this error implementation. We can use this error type as a constant expression. We can't use the error's error string type because that is a struct, and compact struct literal initializers are not constant expressions. So this can be a constant where errors.new cannot. As constants of, the, uh, of our error type are not variables, they're immutable. They can't be changed. And additionally, two constant strings are always equal if their contents are equal. So string one and string two are equal. 
So it follows that two constants of a type derived from string with the same contents are also equal. So to say this another way, equal constant error values are the same in the same that the literal one in your program is the same as all the other literal ones in your program. So now we have all the pieces we need to make Sentinel error values like IOEOF and RSA verification error immutable, fungible, constant expressions. Now this change is probably a bit of a stretch for the Go1 contract. Um, Marcel is going to talk later about the much wider changes happening to error handling in Go. Um, I don't think it's applicable to try and make this change to the standard library. But there's absolutely no reason that you can't adopt this pattern if you use Sentinel errors, errors in your packages. So Go's constants are powerful. Um, I think if you only think of them as like immutable numbers or final numbers that you can't change, I think you're missing out on a lot of their power. Go's constants let us compose programs um, that are more correct and are harder to misuse. So today I've given you three ways to use constants. They're probably just more than a typical fixed number. Um, but now it's over to you. Um, I'm excited to see what you can do with these ideas. Thank you very much.